I'm Jeff Hurt and I'll be your moderator today. Andy Barrow will be your presenter. On the right hand side, down at the bottom, you'll see a white text box. We're going to ask you some questions from time to time and we'd like for you to text in your responses, your thoughts, and also your questions. Now I'm going to turn it over to Andy Barrow. Good day to everyone. I'm very excited to be here and have the opportunity to present some really interesting and new information. You had a choice to be here, and unlike the airlines who say the cabin door is about to close, the cabin door here never closes, and you'll have the opportunity to move around anytime you want. And I wanna thank Jeff for moderating the text chat. So let's start off. I'm in uh, Pittsburgh. It's still freezing, and it's still starting to snow yet again. What I'd like to do is ask you, where are you? Please type in your city, and what kind of weather are you having out there? So on the right hand side in that white text box, please type in your city and what your weather's like. You know, we always want to know what the weather's like in other people's cities, where, where they live, where they're working. So some of it has come in and we have Katrina Smith who says that um, she is in St. Louis and it's cloudy and overcast today. We have Dave and he's in Colorado Springs. Um, he says it's cold. Um, we have Don who is in San Diego, California and we're all jealous of his 70 to 80 degree weather there. We have Tim and George, um, one's in DC, one's in Seattle. Um, we have a couple people in Orlando, Dallas, some in Pittsburgh, some in Cleveland, some in Philadelphia. Turn it back over to you, Andy. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite you <clears throat> to uh, my presenter agreement for attendees. This is what I'm promising you, <clears throat> and you can choose to join with me. I hope you can make this agreement with me. The law of the click is the first part. If you don't agree with what you're watching, you have my permission to leave at any time. Now, barring a uh, call from an extraterrestrial, I'd like to ask if you could put your mobile device on vibrate. That's uh, a big thank you there. Now, you're welcome to do social sharing. You can type, you can text, you can take notes. And Jeff will be here to help us broadcast the ones uh, that come in over the uh, presentation here. Now. The first thing is to recognize that our goal here is to understand before we act. You'll see this weird picture that kind of got your attention. We put it up because we'd like our goal today to help you to understand before any of us take any action. Now, this is a safe place. I declare it as a place where you can agree, disagree, ponder and question. And finally, you have a free pass. You have a free pass to participate, but it's okay if you do, it's okay anytime you want to, and it's okay if you don't want to. Now, just really quickly, a little bit about me. I'm a business owner. I'm a compulsive tourist. Despite uh, working a lot on my business, I collect countries. At this point, I've been to seven continents, 84 territories and countries, and thirdly, uh, 47 states. One of my big passions is classic rock and roll. If uh, the band has at least one dead member, I'm really, really uh, a big fan of, of, of watching rock and roll. Now, I'd like to ask you about your business. As I said, I own Beerwell Growth Consulting, but how about texting in and Jeff will be recording what kind of business you own? And Andy would also like to know if they didn't own a small business, what would they be doing? Right, if right. To the next slide. Yes, and, and what I'd like to do is build on this and say, if you didn't own your business, what would you like to do? Well, if I didn't own a business, I would lead a rock band. Now, if you could just type in what you think you'd like to be if you uh, weren't uh, running a business, uh, let's talk about that. Okay, so I have some comments coming in. Katrina is a small business owner, and um, she says if she was not a small business owner, she would be a registered nurse or a nurse practitioner. Steve says if he was not a small business owner, um, he'd be working for another small business owner. He'd be the COO or CFO. Dave says that if he was not a small business owner, he would probably be um, like you, uh, playing a rock and roll band, or he'd be a race car driver. Um, Sue says if she was not a small business owner, she'd be a veterinarian. Tim says if he was not a small business owner, he might be a lawyer. And George says he would probably run for political office. So that's what someone's come in, Andy. 
It's fascinating. And it's very interesting to see that uh, <clears throat> most business owners still pick something that's an individual uh, uh, vo uh, vocation or something they dream to do. I guess we're all, uh, we're all cats and we all really enjoy finding our own paths. So now I'd like to share with you what are our webinar goals today. These will be what our goal is to have you understand by the end of the webinar. First is you're gonna, we'll be able to describe how the chief business owner must serve as the GPS for business growth. Secondly, you'll be able to compare the executive functions of the CEO's brain with the executive functions of business growth. And thirdly, you'll be able to identify and demonstrate the importance of the executive's essential capabilities. And I'd like to ask, which of these learning objectives are most important to you? Please text them in to Jeff and pick one or two and tell us what you, uh, which one you are most interested in. Once so Andy, we'll go to the next slide and we'll just let them read those. We'll give them a couple seconds. Sure. Go ahead and put in one, two or three and tell us why which one of these learner outcomes interests you? What resonates with you? And give us a little bit of why. Oops, if you'll go back, please. Okay. There we go. So um, we have some responses coming in. We have um, a couple of number twos really interested in um, what their executive functions of business growth are in their brain. Um, we have some number ones, some number threes. Um, are some people really curious on what you mean by GPS for business growth? They're looking forward for you to explaining that. And we have some more twos and some more threes. Well, that's terrific. And we're going to uh, satisfy all the questions uh, and we'll spend some time on each of the three. First and foremost, this presentation is really about what's in it for you. First of all, we're going to spend the time and everything we talk about is really designed to help you to figure out how you can be more successful in leading your organization. Let's start with the brain. The brain and running a business have a lot in common. Hey, after all, running a business shouldn't be brain surgery, should it? Well, actually, it sort of is because underneath everything, it really is about uh, your brain. And so it does have a lot to do with brain surgery. Now, someone asked about GPS growth, and uh, here's where I get to explain it. Isn't most of your organization uh, the engine that's focused on getting there, wherever you define there is? Now, you as the chief executive, you have a windshield. You're looking out ahead. You're seeing what's within uh, the next, uh, really, eyesight. And th that's a great way that you help your organization and lead it day to day. But when you think about it, you also have to be a GPS. Now, what does a GPS do? It helps you be, by seeing over the hill. It sees what's coming up even further down the road, and it calculates the best way and the best route to get to your destination. So if you think about this and how important it is, the things that you think of that can hamper you as a business owner, there are things that either hamper you or there are things that can foster growth. So with that in mind, uh, why don't we think about the kind of things that, that you can do? Well, you can influence your business, right? You do that every day. Your brain is a, um, uh, as we said, it's a, it's a device. It's something that you can use to uh, hamper or foster growth. And how your brain functions and how it, you project what you're thinking to your team's brains certainly impacts your team's brain. And when all those come together, they can function as they were designed to do. So you think about it, these are your controllable, modifying, modifiable levers. Your brain does have a natural biological function. So it's really important to recognize that if you go counter, when you go counter to these brain's functions, you can create dysfunction. So with that in mind, why don't we think a little bit about how you can cause profitable growth? Well, success of your business begins and ends with your brain. That's the tie-in, that's the connection. So what I'd like to do now is ask you to text in one trait as a business owner or looking at business owners that you think business owners are good at. And let me start out as you're uh, giving Jeff, Jeff some of your thoughts. One of the things I've noticed after a long time in consulting is that business owners, once they're established, become very good at risk aversion. 
They really try all they can, they can to make sure that what they've created, there's no risk to it. So what I'd uh, like to do now is to go on and talk about operating systems. We all have computers. And if I can interrupt you there. We have some people that have te texted in some comments for you. On um, You asked them what their traits were. Sure, let's, let's hear what they have to say. So um, we have some people who are saying they're, they're good at be, being a visionary. They have a vision and a goal. Um, leadership, good at sales. They're passionate about um, where they want to take their company, what they want to sell, and also what their customer wants or needs. And then we have some that are good at predicting what customers want before they even say that they want it. So that's some of the traits that have come in. Boy, that's great. It talks about, uh, frankly, being the GPS we talked about earlier, and really all the kinds of things that go into both passion and to uh, really the heavy-duty thinking that comes uh, with being an owner. Thanks a lot to all of you that uh, gave us some of those comments, and thank you, Jeff, for keeping me on track. So onward to the operating system. We, I maintain that the operating system of your computer and your brain are quite similar. After all, the operating system is hardwired. And so just like your brain is, there are certain functions that are just critical that uh, you recognize like an operating system. And what this means is that if you ignore the operating system of your computer, you know what happens. It starts to malfunction. Well, the biology of the brain is similar in that it can malfunction. If you put garbage in, you get garbage out. If there's a uh, user error, that certainly uh, causes challenges. And finally, malfunctions happen with the wrong keystrokes. Now, just like your computer, you, can, uh, you can't make it operate differently. What you have to do is you have to understand that it works the same. Now, if we ignore the brain's function, then it starts to malfunction. We forget this and sometimes, heaven we all said the wrong thing, or uh, emphasized uh, a certain task. And when we do that, not only do we hijack our own brains, but we can hijack the very brains of the folks that we're trying to get and keep on the right path. And this is because your thinking really becomes flawed and your, bleh, your brain can flourish because the brain doesn't really know real facts from false facts. And when it's confronted with something that's not absolutely clear, it really reverts to the fear factor, you know, fight or flight. So what we try to do is uh, we really uh, try to understand that when this happens, when the brain thinking is flawed, it can't focus on profitable growth and it goes down rabbit trails. So it's critical that you will have a hard time and you have to prevent your hard time from keeping your head wrapped around profitable growth. And so understanding the natural biology of your brain and your team's brain functions is really critical because when you do, this will help you to lead your company to success and a profitable growth because when your brain is aligned, you can take the first steps towards profitable growth. Now, and you, we have a comment that came in, if I can interrupt you. Sure, of course. Um, Dave has said that uh, he, he's quoting... Um, T. Boone's Pickens it says, you know, when you're hunting for elephants, don't get distracted by rabbits. And he just threw that in because he thought that was kind of aligned with what you were saying about keeping the keeping your eyes focused on the main thing. It, it surely surely is. And as um as uh, uh, our friend in um you know said the the main thing. What was that movie called again? Uh, I think it was Sparky. It was um the movie of Billy Crystal where he talked about the main thing you have to remember. So here's the rub. If you don't remember the main thing, you have to be careful because as the chief executive, as the woman or man at the top, if you operate in any way uh, that uh, makes your brain uh, function and, un and if it's unable to perform, then what happens is you can create a team or a culture where their brains cannot work properly. So the alignment of your brain with theirs is critical. And if it doesn't happen, this is where uh, you can literally run off the road and not have profitable growth. One of my favorite sayings from my uh, is uh, that you become what you tolerate. You become what you tolerate. So the key is 
is to really stay on track and create the culture and the pathway that you want to get to your profitable growth. Now, let's talk about your chief executive functions. There are three things, the top three things that are the most important things that as a chief executive, you can function and you can uh, focus on. The first one is attention. Now, I've had many uh, businesses and clients, just like our friend, I think it was Dave that just uh, texted in, that are very easily distracted by the short term, which affects vision and thus uh, the management team. Uh, it's very easy, as we've all heard, uh, to focus on the urgent instead of focusing on uh, what's critical. Now, the good thing about attention is when you have it, you can focus on the rel relevant information and block that which uh, isn't relevant. Now, in order to do that, the key is inhibition, the second uh, three of, of the three things. The uh, skill of inhibition is really the ability to not do certain actions that may be distract distractive or irrelevant uh, to the work you're trying to do. In fact, it's destructive. And here's some examples. Have you ever heard someone in your company or even yourself say, well, we already tried that? Or uh, my favorite one is I'll hear owners say, well, we have an open door policy when everyone knows uh, not only is it uh, not true, but that the reason the door is open is because the hinges are broken and the doors actually cannot close. So the key is to uh, inhibit the negative, uh, the negative distractions. Now, the third piece is the ability to take your attention and your inhibition and put it into working memory. Now, Working memory is the ability to retain and access relevant information for reasoning and decisions and further action. What you process and keep in your brain is what really is important. So you want to follow your GPS, but you still have to look out the front windshield. But keep in mind that what, you, uh, what you're looking at in terms of the three pieces, attention and inhibition and working memory, all not only have to happen, but they have to happen in this order. First, attention, then inhibition, and then working memory. Now, this is a great chance, if you would, to text into Jeff, which one do you think you need to improve the most? Attention, or inhibition, or working memory? So, Andy, while you were talking, we had a couple of comments already come in. Um, and Sue said that along the same lines of we, we tried that in the past is the phrase, our customers won't do that. Um, and that can be a catchphrase where people get stuck. Um, and then we also had George who said that um, that's not what we're supposed to be selling. We're supposed to be selling X. And he said it's the battle between features and products and solutions that oftentimes he and his team get stuck with. So I have a lot of people who are saying this inhibition piece is critical. And um, we have a comment that came in from Steve who says, if you let your brain get full of the distractions, then you have no working memory to stay focused on the main goal, which really aligns with what you're saying. Boy, is it true. And I think sometimes uh, the folks that are working directly with customers have used one of my favorite lines, which is, uh, if it wasn't for customers, just imagine how much better our organization would run. Uh, the reality, of course, is that that's uh, not true. <laughs> and so the, the, the idea of being inhibited and keeping the outside influences, you're focusing on the customer, but at the same time, you have to make sure that the value your company uh, offers is being, you're focusing on that and you're not in getting that inhibited by the customer uh, really taking you off on a different tangent. So uh, when, we're, when we're looking at these things, we must recognize that the brains must be able to really focus on something specific. That's, that's important, as is not getting off track by being focused on or being distracted by other data inputs. Boy, I'll tell you, between texts and emails and now uh, Skypes and then, of course, somebody walking in your office uh, and, of course, the phone ringing, gee, uh, it's really tough, but we have to be able to be consciously aware of the relevant information and not whatever's coming in all at the same time. Because when we do these things, it unlocks, unlocks the higher order circuitry of the brain. And therefore, let's go back and review. Attention is essential, but it's really not enough. You have to have 
its two siblings. It cannot thrive without the siblings of attention, which are inhibition and working memory. So let's go back to your role as the chief executive. Good, great chief executives set boundaries uh, in terms of their attention, inhibition, and working memory. Remember, you're the exemplar for your organization. If you are uh, continually distracted and continually uh, indicate this, uh, demonstrate this to your folks, guess what? They're going to start to embrace that same behavior. So next question uh, is, uh, um, excuse me, I jumped ahead a little bit. Great chief executives attend to what's important. They inhibit what's not important. And finally, they focus on uh, the relevant pieces required for profitable growth. So again, they serve as an exemplar. Now, once they do this, then the question is, what are we going to do? What, are, what, are, what do you think you need the help with? So again, if you could text into Jeff, what do you need to focus on for profitable growth? Well, Andy, we've had a question come in from Tim, and he says, what tips do you have for practicing um, inhibition and not getting distracted by the extraneous information that can derail the focus, attention, and working memory? Well, first and foremost, uh, inter uh, look at your email every, every hour if you possibly can. Maybe that's a little tough. There's nothing wrong with having a closed-door policy so you can do some thinking. And... Uh, I think an, a, an interesting way of inhibition, actually, I've seen this with a lot of my clients, is uh, to really empower other folks so that they make decisions instead of always checking with you and distracting you from, from uh, ensuring that what they would do anyway is, uh, is uh, the right thing. I had a client, it was really great, he had a stuffed monkey in his office, and whenever somebody came in, and asked a question, uh, he would inhibit uh, distractions by throwing the monkey at the person and saying, the monkey's on your back now. Uh, so that was his version of inhibiting outside distractions. Okay, so uh, we think- so we all should just go buy some stuffed monkeys. <laughs> yes, so we all should go out and buy stuffed monkeys, yes. So how, uh, how do you keep disrupt disruptive or irrelevant uh, uh, or destructive uh, information from getting in, getting your attention, and uh, certainly feel free to uh, be texting uh, Jeff. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a couple questions here. What uh, what structures, what disciplines, and what practices do you feel help your team uh, to attend to what's important? So, if we get some more texts in uh, on some of these questions, I'd be glad to respond. So Andy, we, we have somebody who said that this is really about that GPS and leading by example and teaching the team to focus on what is important and not interrupting with um, the rabbit trails, so to speak, but learning to put the rabbit trails to the side and focus on the main goal. And then um, Sue has put typed in that it's about teaching the team to be strategic thinkers versus logistical or you know, like you said earlier, urgent thinkers and really keeping the mind focused on the strategy and the big picture so that they're all working together forward. Boy, is that is that a fact? And when we watch both our leaders and, uh, you know, frankly, what's interesting is I think watching the news uh, every night when there's more than one big story is one really good example of on one hand, how much, how distracting it can be when you're just starting to think about one story and then the next one comes on. On the other hand, you watch how the newscasters are so focused on on one story, then another, then another. So it's an interesting point, and Sue's absolutely right. Uh, strategic thinking is key, and I know Jeff will be talking about that uh, uh, in upcoming webinars. So when we look at uh, the next step is uh, how, do you, how, do, how do you as a chief executive move to the next level of function? Because when you can activate attention and inhibition and working memory properly, then you can uh, enable the next level of executive capabilities. So again, once you have attention, inhibition, and working memory, now you're good to go for the next level. And here's uh, the first of several that are examples of how you have to go forward to the higher level. The first one, of course, is goal selection. It's important uh, that you, you get a big picture, you set your goals, and you decide which of these are your goals and which ones are the team's goals. So 
You have to choose goals based on priority and relevance, experience and knowledge of this reality. And of course, you're responsible for anticipating outcomes and consequences. So as you get more disciplined and appreciate this higher level of goal selection, the good news is your brain will start to operate more and more naturally. The second one is planning an organization. Now, planning an organization, of course, are generating steps and sequences of behavior that lead to profitable growth. Knowing that what is needed along the way is including of strategies and resources. So the second one of planning an organization is another higher level uh, capability that's critical. The third one is initiation and persistence. Now, once we have the goal selection and planning an organization, then uh, initiation and persistence, of course, is beginning and maintaining goal-directed behavior despite the distractions, intrusions, or changes in demands. Boy, if I've seen it uh, a thousand times, I've seen it a million. People uh, will, can, will come back from uh, uh, either a meeting or uh, seeing customers or going out in the plant and say, this is what we're going to do. And then it's so easy that uh, with everything that comes along after that, not to uh, begin and maintain the directed behavior. So remember, you're responsible for initiating and persisting at this goal beha uh, directed behavior. The next one is flexibility. Flexibility as a higher level function, of course, is the ability to adapt, think strategically, and solve problems. In some, again, adapt, think, and solve. Uh, very important for chief executives. Execution and goal attainment is so important. Why? Because when you can execute the plan within the limits of not just time, but other constraints. For example, if you're running a family business, chances are that every member of your family is not uh, uh, suited to be a, a chief executive or, or maybe even an executive. So when you're executing a plan and goal attainment, it's not just about the money or the time. It's really this culture and it's almost uh, how comfortable they are with uh, taking uh, 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 direction uh, and, and, and really running with it. So uh, this notion of execution and goal, goal attainment is so important. The uh, next one uh, is, is, is ultimately the most personal. Self-regulation really is the ability to use self-observation uh, to monitor your own performance. It requires self-judgment to evaluate performance and self-regulation to change to reach goals. So when you look at yourself, Remember, as a business owner, you probably don't have a, uh, a board. You probably uh, aren't licensed or, or need to uh, have gotten any kind of a standard. You set it yourself. And so self-regulation is imperative. So uh, let's, let's, uh, let's see if we can get some more uh, questions. Uh, what do you need to improve? Uh, is it goal selection or generating behaviors? Feel free to text in to Jeff. Which of these is most important to you? And if you select one and text it in, I'll be sure to talk about uh, that one. So, Andy, um, we, we had a question come in that I was holding. If you'll go back to the previous slide. Um, hold on. I went backwards the wrong there way. There we go. Um, and somebody wanted to know, how do you balance the personal needs of your team versus the business strategic goals, particularly if you're, some of your team members seem to be rather um, high maintenance or needy? Well, to quote the great Spock from uh, Star, Star Trek, uh, the needs of the many versus the needs of the few. Uh, <laughs> it's often said uh, that while uh, we all want to be as individually centric as we can, uh, our first accountability is to the group and to how the group performs uh, for the company. As painful as it can be to, uh, you know, a single out or, uh, or even somehow, uh, uh, you know, discipline an individual uh, at the end of the day, the rest of the organization is probably uh, going to be able to be more focused. Now, you know, in our day and age, of course, it's a, it's a challenge because we all recognize the complete value of uh, really trying to bring the best out of every uh, individual. And you as the chief executive, you know, as they say, that's why you get the big bucks. So uh, it will be a challenge and it will probably always be a challenge. So um, George wants to know if you could talk a little bit more about adapt, think, and solve. 
Well, it's an it's a really interesting point. It goes back to what we were saying about uh, you know when the brain is confronted with information that is that is inconsistent, it tends to uh, go into that fight or flight, that defensive mode. And really, what this talks about is uh, the need to adapt, uh, which is basically putting your your fears of uh, fright and and flight uh, 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 off to the side and saying, "Gee whiz, we've got to adapt." I mean, there's so many stories now. Uh, one of my favorite ones is, you know, the, the Walt Disney Organization is a pretty uh, uh, disciplined, controlled organization. And when they uh, came out with that outbreak of uh, measles uh, at Disneyland, it probably forced them to be a little more adaptive and think about how they could interact uh, with uh, the Center for Disease Control that really needed to track those measles. So they worked together and the Disney organization adapted. They thought through how they were going to, uh, uh, you know, do, do the right job and at the same time not lose their uh, their discipline and control. And they did solve the problem. And I believe we haven't heard about uh, the measles outbreak uh, getting any uh, getting any larger. So that's that's a that's a, hopefully that's some help. And we've had quite a few people who say that. Um, the second point, generating behaviors and strategy is critical for them and um, they're beginning to realize that perhaps a strategy is within their GPS but they haven't shared that GPS with the rest of their team. Well, that's a great question because on one hand everyone should see the GPS but on the other hand you don't need two backseat drivers uh, and especially if every so often they're looking up from their own uh, texting. So uh, while it's important to teach folks uh, the GPS and, and for those that are ready to use it, that's excellent. Uh, but as you were saying, and we heard from the audience, uh, uh, the need for strategic thinking probably starts with the ability to recognize that strategic thinking is looking over the next hill. So it's a, it's a learned process and it's uh, not something that you can walk in a room and say, today, from now on, we're strategic thinking. Uh, so uh, I hope that answers that. And uh, Jeff, I'd like to uh, I'd like to move along a little bit here. Is that all right with you? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, finally, this is uh, sort of the last chance for for some questions. And I guess I'd like to ask, what are you going to do with what you now understand? And you don't even you know if you want to uh, ask a question, Jeff will certainly. Uh, but this is as much for a, a, a self reflection, uh, for really some introspection. Uh, what is it that you're going to do with now? now that you understand this. So um, Jeff, if we have one or two last questions, that's great. Anything coming up? Well, we have some comments that people are saying that you're really causing them to think and be a little bit more introspective and reflective that um, what they allow and what they create really is where their business is now, that they're the ones that have led that to be where it is to now. And they need to go back and rethink how can they realign their GPS with the um, strategy of the business. So there, there's quite a few comments um, that people really like this thought process of um, the executive functions of the brain aligning with the executive functions of the CEO and the owner. Well, it, it's it's something we're all, uh, it's the, probably the definition of we're all learning it every day uh, since the recession has uh, uh, ended. So much has changed. And so we all have to understand uh, what we, what, what, what we did understand what it now looks like, and frankly, look ahead and say, what is it going to look like uh, in the coming in the coming uh, months and years? So, what I'd like to do now is uh, uh, start to conclude by reminding us of the three things that we said uh, we were going to learn and be able to do at the end of the presentation. The first one is is to describe how the chief business owner must serve as the GPS for business growth. Secondly, uh, we've learned how to compare the executive functions of the CEO's brain with the executive functions of business growth. And finally, we've learned how to identify and demonstrate the importance of the executive's essential capabilities. So I'd like to thank Jeff and thank you and thank you for all your comments as we've explored this uh, interesting and ever uh, evolving topic of the chief executive's brain functions. So thank you and here's to your chief executive thinking. I'm Andy Birol and Jeff Hurt. Uh, and this concludes, go ahead Andy. Thanks.